And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Giga Heart, the creator of the... The sci-fi RPG Quantum State. The one and only JC Cole. How you doing today, man? Hey, Mildred. Thank you for having me. I am so happy to be here. Thank you for coming on. So, it's a bit of a tradition, aside from all the drinking, to open up with the humble beginnings of a sort. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. My introduction into role-playing games... All right. Uh, well, <clears throat> I first heard about role playing games uh, in college. Uh, I went to Full Sail University, where they actually have uh, a game degree, game design degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, one of the creators of Dungeons and Dragons was a teacher there while I was a student there, uh, Dave Arnitson. Oh, I know, I know him. He's fr he's from he's from where I am. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Well, he used to teach at the school I went to. I never went into his class, but I saw that it was really popular, and I decided to check out some books, which the first books I bought were D&D 4th Edition, and for the life of me, I could not get anybody to play with me. Yeah, the if it's at the time where I'm thinking the Hate Brigade for 4th Edition was at full swing, though I... um. I always found I always found the hate to be o to be overblown, and I agree. There's a lot there's a lot that I really liked within 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 fourth edition. Me too. I feel like it set up the cinematic experiences a lot better, even if the combat wasn't as smooth. Um, considering what came before the, there was a lot of things that I liked over over it. Chief among them being the de the lack of the Vancian model when it came to casters, and just the fact that casters were not a win button. Absolutely. Uh, I agree about the, the Vancian model, uh, which, and 3.5, which would become later Pathfinder, and uh, a whole bunch of other games, really, were based off of 3.5. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I found that that was really the uh, game that really stuck with me, and I was able to find... Uh, people to play with and and that was really formulative uh, formulaic to my tabletop gaming experiences i think of, i think the word you mean is formative formative yes that's the one thank you uh yeah formative to my uh tabletop role-playing experiences and uh it was from there uh me doing homebrews of pathfinder and uh trying to you know uh, make things a, a bit more tweaked to how i wanted it to be that started my journey into making my own game yeah and Pathfinder and 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 three point five, that is that is leaning very much that is, that is obviously um, straight fantasy. Although although D and D has had has had an issue for years about what sort of fantasy it's supposed to be, but that's another story. I agree. Um, to go from that to to sci fi fa sci fi fantasy is quite a is quite a jump. So. I suppose I suppose one of the first things I should ask in regard to quantum state is what some of the things in your appendix N would be if you're familiar with the concept of appendix N. Uh, appendix N, can you expand on that a little bit? Appendix N was a section in um er, when very early versions of D and D during the TSR era that listed rec that listed recommended. Recommended reading, watching, viewing. Oh, that, kind of that one. Okay, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Okay, so yeah, uh, if you want media that would be akin to it, either aesthetically or spiritually speaking, uh, I would say that uh, you could look at like Westworld, uh, the Fallout series, um, Wasteland, The Road. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I would say, the, a lot of the fantasy kind of parts. Uh, it, it leans really into that dark gothic fantasy or that Victorian type style that you would see in Bloodborne. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, a lot of the sci-fi, I would say that it leans more into the cyberpunk kind of genre, which is really coming into its own uh, as this kind of like, you know, uh, high-tech, low-life, uh, corporate 
you know, corporate overlords and gangs running the streets and, a, you know, blasted out world. And then we kind of combine that sort of element with uh, the likes of Red Dead Redemption, just this sort of beautiful, open, untamed land where, you know, there's these blood feuds and claims and uh, all sorts of, you know, the laws on, on your tail, you got to get out, uh, you know, make, make for the, make for the horizon uh, and sort of this, uh, and coming from a, a sci-fi level equivalent to like Star Trek, where basically humanity reached kind of this peak, uh, and they were able to create all of the things that technology would enable them to create. And then they were from that peak thrown into a wild Western style dark age where, uh, you know, uh, there is these little bits and pieces of an ancient past where everything was basically a utopia. And now uh, you can, you know, people are vying to reclaim those pieces to wield the power that they represent. Mm -hmm. So with, with that in mind, when I, when I looked through the um, quick start that you, that you had provided me, um, one of the things I had noticed is that in, is that of all the die to use, you you end up going with a, um, if I'm not mistaken, a ro a roll high there? d. Sorry. Oh, hang on a second. Discord decided to be Discord. Okay, there we go. All right, as are I we was good? As I was saying, um, of all the die systems to go with, you end up going with a. D with a d10 based approach what made you pick that die in particular so we use a different math system and i after people started asking me about it, i realized that uh maybe i should come up with a name for it <laughs> uh so i've been calling it the lodestone system uh and this uses a d10 uh, and we chose a d10 over d20 because we wanted the uh the, those dopamine hits that you get when you roll a critical hit we wanted that to occur twice as often also, we found it easier to create a quick and like improvisational uh, math system for setting difficulties for roles, uh, and that was a lot easier to do using deviations of ten than it was with deviations of twenty. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so uh, more critical is more often, and uh, easier ways to balance uh, and create improvisational numbers based on what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, with the D10 system, it functions a lot similar to the traditional uh, D20 system, but instead we roll a D10 and you know you add that number to whatever from your character sheet, and uh, <clears throat> then uh, any sort of uh, damage and stuff uh, is rolled uh, using uh, a number of smaller dice uh, up to D10, uh, and then the scale of those uh, increases the number of dice as you grow in levels. So, so it is. So it's not going to be a case where you're just rolling one d10. Per period. Um, even even at high even at high level, the amount of d10s you're going to be rolling is is going to expand. No, no, no. You roll one d10. Period for the entirety of the game. The only time that doesn't happen is when you are rolling damage, which damage gets bigger over time. All right. And I'm guessing. I'm guessing damage is just, is going to be a variety of, of die types, it's just that D10 is the primary one. Correct. Oh. So damage can be as a D4, D6, D8, or D10. Mm -hmm. And then the number of dice plus a flat bonus from the sheet. For instance, if you do a melee attack and the attacker has a uh, plus 15 to their damage and they roll a 10 on, or I'm sorry, they have to roll 2d6 for the actual damage roll, so they would roll 2d6, let's say they get 3 and 3, that is 6 plus 10, you know, 16 to hit. Yeah. HP goes down 16. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing, one thing that, one thing that I was curious, because you do, you do have a, a interesting setup when it comes to the classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that that's probably the, the bread and butter of what makes it unique and uh, super interesting and from my perspective. Mm -hmm. So I'd like, I'd like to go through the class list that, that I have in front of me. Absolutely. Can it, can I get a feel for what, e what each particular class brings to the table? But before, oh, definitely. Before I do that, um, 
what made you want to go with this this notion of you pick fr you pick from two you pick from two classes and that merges into a hybrid class all right i'll tell you where uh i originally got the idea and i wanted it not exactly like this but it was based off of the job systems from the original final fantasy tactics where you could level up multiple jobs to get a new job. That was something that I wanted to, to explore. Mm -hmm. I found that uh, if I did more than two into the mix, that that really would create just a, a massive headache of just jobs building into jobs building into jobs. So by narrowing it down to just you can pick two and mix them, that gives 36 different options, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty wild as far as like just initial offerings for a, a role-playing game. So, starting starting on with the with the list, um, mm -hmm. we'll start with adept. All right, yeah, the adept is going to be your classic mage. Uh, you could really consider it to be like a black mage. Uh, they get all of your your standard magic stuff as far as like levitation, telekinesis, opening portals, scrying, doing astral projection out of their bodies, levitating, mm -hmm. things you would consider like magic. And then uh, they also get uh, an advantage when using elements. Anybody can use elements, but adepts are particularly good at them. Uh, and they, uh, as part of that advantage, uh, they are able to take multiple elements and then merge them together to create new elements. Mm -hmm. For instance, if they take biotic, which is like acid type themed, uh, and then uh, cryonic, which is water and ice, they can mix those together and then they get, you know, terra wood wall type you know, wood controlling magics. Um, and so there's kind of like this level of uh, extra spell. Yeah. Now the now of course the next the next one on the list would be um, Apothic. Unless I unless I missed unless I missed something. <laughs> oh. Hold on. Hold on a moment. All right. Uh yeah, the apothic is uh it's a pretty unique one, I think. I I don't really see that uh covered a lot in uh other RPGs, but basically it's a mixture between kind of a scientist uh, and an alchemist and a doctor. Um, so you got kind of this like it, it can be anything from like a chef to you know a battlefield medic to a, a mad scientist that is like you know performing experience experiments in a lab that kind of uh, person but they get a lot of healing and poison type abilities and things that you might consider to be uh, like necromancy but through a, a science fiction filter uh, also they get a lot of abilities that allow them to rewrite genetics and do like shape shifting body morphing type stuff so an equal part of pharmacist and harmacist. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and we, we split that w uh, with a new term we call philosophy, which is uh, just because something is unethical, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if the science says that it can happen, then why shouldn't it happen? Yeah. Uh, and that's like a whole branch of, of their <laughs> heroic actions. Mm -hmm. So... Next would be the Armsman. All right, the Armsman is going to be your classical fighter uh, archetype, you know, uh, melee weapon specialist. Uh, they get, uh, in the same way that the Adept uh, gets an advantage at using elemental abilities, uh, the Armsman trains melee weapons faster and gets more out of their melee weapon experience, or melee weapon training. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can also uh, inflict injuries, uh, which are a type of status effect uh, as a part of any melee attack. So if they're using any sort of special technique, they also want to, you know, make somebody bleed or, you know, blind somebody or break their arm or whatever, then they can probably do that as a part of the action. And uh, and then outside of that, they uh, can fight without wearing armor and they get preferred weapons and, and things like that. Uh, and a lot of uh, melee techniques focused on wielding weapons. Mm-hmm. It is an, it is interesting since um the big problem the big the big problem with the selling point of the fighter archetype is that is that oh you can wield any weapon 
which doesn't have as much doesn't have all that much appeal when most people are going to stick to one particular way to equip their character and stick to it. Uh, well, actually, we address that uh, sort of. Uh, we have a modular weapon system, so you start out with a frame, and you get to add mods to it based on the way that you do training. And uh, as you build your character out, you'll have a unique weapon that is, is exclusively suited to your tastes that you've built based on the ways the things that you've tra uh, trained. And uh, additionally, uh, there's uh, passive bonuses that you get from weapon training. Uh, so armsmen will excel in like uh, close quarters combat over their counterparts. Yeah, and that that I that I can I can certainly see. In the also, I think I want to point out uh, in quantum state. Uh, martial characters towards the end game become Herculean figures, capable of like doing crazy feats of strength, uh, something out of an anime or, or more unrealistic uh, than just like a, a strong knight that gets an extra couple of attacks each turn. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's much more monumental than that. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, there's already a very gladiatorial look look to them at look to them as is from the from the artwork that you had shared with me. Mm -hmm. And I know it'd be tempting to, tempting to say that because because martial because martial character, but just the just the fact that um, with a lot of them, there's not a whole lot of he of heavy armor. Mm -hmm. But next is the brawler, which from the design that I'm seeing with them, I feel I feel like this I feel like this would end up being my pick if I'm gonna keep my gimmick. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, the people that like to play monks or fist fighters, martial artists, would feel very at home with the brawler. Uh, I tried to lean more into uh, being a, a boxer, kind of. I wanted to get away from, because it's supposed to be Western, I was trying to get away from the Eastern influences of uh, martial arts and, and do a more, uh, you know, prize fighter kind of uh, motif or, or theme for, for the class. Um, <clears throat> So they get uh, a lot of mobility. They can take stances uh, that change the way that they uh, can interact with their environment, and uh, they can also uh, they're they're better at grappling and they can knock people out cold. Mm -hmm. So next would be the cavalier. The cavalier is another one of the ones where I haven't super seen it done uh, a whole lot. Um, they can uh, deflect ranged attacks as a parry, so they can parry ranged attacks. They get bonuses to wielding shields, and uh, they also uh, get a steed. They have a, an animal companion or a machine companion. It can be a sentient machine that they can ride around uh, like a knight. Yeah, yeah, they're they're a knight, pretty much. I'd I'd say use I'd say giving them the. There was there was a cavalier class in early AD and D that was more mm -hmm. of the was more of the bore in the saddle kind of, kind of archetype. It yeah, didn't get yeah. a whole lot of use because it's kind of hard to be mounted when you're in. It's kind of hard to have a bore in the saddle. Um, you're supposed to be mounted kind of character in a game called exactly. Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, totally. And there are situations where, like, you know, if the steed can't get to you, you don't have your steed. And the steed kind of acts like as an extension of the knight, and it's just as effective as the knight is in other places. Um, but, <clears throat> yeah, and also I think that uh, the, the hybridization sort of aspect of it allows you to kind of put that as a, a back burner kind of subclass for you if that's something that you're worried about or if you want that to be a dominant side of your character you can highlight that and, and push those those levels early to get you know a, a bigger stronger animal companion out of it mm -hmm. so the delinquent that's going to be your classic rogue or thief archetype um, they are on lookout they're good at finding hidden stuff uh, and they are good at making sure they act during an ambush and they can do sneak attacks which I think is pretty common mm -hmm. uh, common mechanic used especially for you know sneaky type characters um, they can also uh, dodge uh, an attack after the effect 
So if they get hit, they can choose to use their reaction to try to dodge it afterwards. And if they successfully dodge it, then they negate the attack. Mm -hmm. um, Marine. So that's going to be, uh, it's kind of like your classic trooper or soldier archetype. Um, this is something it's most reflected in uh, the ranger, I, I would say, as far as just having like a favored terrain. They, they prefer a turf where they do better. Um, and while they're in the turf, they uh, have better perceptions and initiative. And uh, they can also get a bunch of, uh, I'm sorry, they have a bunch of features that uh, revolve around the use of firearms effectively, uh, increasing the amount of damage they do with ranged attacks by aiming instead of moving. Uh, or they can just, uh, my favorite ability they have is called Empty the Clip, and that's where they just fire every remaining round of ammo they have in their equipped weapon. Mm -hmm. Um. You could probably you could probably put in flavor text for that one. I've got a bullet with your name on it, and I'm gonna keep shooting until I find it. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, but but I can I can see I can see where I can see where you're where you're going, especially since one of the a lot of a lot of the images that in the exa in the art that you had sent um, have mm -hmm. them with some form of long arm. And then there's and then there's one who deci who decides to to go to go with um <laughs> with, the, with a three barrel minigun. Yes, the chain guns are a thing. Uh, you you can have. I have a whole class. Like for instance, the marine and the uh, cavalier together make a class called the juggernaut, and that guy gets you know better chain gun use and uh, every time they don't move while they're shooting their initiative score goes up so if they pass you they can attack again mm -hmm. um, given given the, since you call it that I'm, pr I'm pretty sure somebody has referenced that line from X-Men from X-Men 3 play, um, Absolutely. play testing cause... yeah uh, it, it definitely comes up uh, they, they're also fun to use as uh, as bosses mm-hmm when creating, you know, enemies for people to fight. It's real easy to just pull from one of the hybrid classes. Yeah. Uh, so next would be mechanic. Uh, this is one that I think is pretty wholly unique uh, as far as... I mean, I've seen mechanics played in other, uh, other games, like Starfinder has a mechanic... Uh, uh, this one, the mechanic has a drone, but it's not a creature. It's more like a familiar. It's an extension of themselves. Um, and they can use it to facilitate their abilities within a, a radius. Uh, and then there are also uh, machine-type creatures are, are prevalent and around. So uh, robots are, are a big part of the beast theory. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> And me mechanics have the ability to possess them, so they can. It's called digital collar, and they can use their tools to take control over a machine, and then uh, it'll do their bidding for a short duration. And uh, if they get one that is deactivated during their downtime, they can permanently bind it to their control and have it as a summon. And they kind of play like a summoner with mm -hmm. uh, a drone that allows them to do like buffs and support. And uh, it's kind of a, a heavy leaning support gadgetry type class. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Uh, so, in other words, they solve practical problems. Exactly. Yeah, all about you know the the physical mechanics of of getting things mm -hmm. to, do, to to get done logistically. Yeah. Um, Warden. Uh, this is another one. Uh, it's kind of unique. They're based off of uh, what I call the influencer archetype. And they're really their place where they excel is in social situations. Uh, they have an aura that they produce uh, that palp the around them, um, <clears throat> and they uh, are able to counterattack spellcasters or anybody that uses a heroic action. They can uh, use their words to distract or insult or you know uh, disrupt them in some way. Uh, which causes them to accidentally harm themselves as a part of their action. Uh, they just they get it wrong in a way that hurts, and uh, that makes them take unavoidable damage. And uh, the warden can also produce a dome, and they can uh, prevent status effects from taking place. Yeah. Um, diplomancer comes to, is the word that comes to mind. Yeah, that is uh, a pretty good uh, good way to put it. A diplomancer. Yeah, a diplomat. 
they're usually framed as being like a celebrity or a cleric or a priest, uh, somebody that's there as like spiritual guidance mm -hmm. or emotional support. Yeah. Um. So, with that, with that, with that in mind, um, mm -hmm. given the given the given the fact that you're d that um, there's the in, there's the implication that you're using. Two, you're making you're making a hybrid class with two, with two. Um, Correct. But I, from what I saw with the character sheet set up, it looks like these things cap at ten. Are you is the is the game only having ten levels total, or is it a case where you're le where you're leveling them up um, separately? It's the case where you're leveling them up separately. The total level is going to be 40. So you get to pick one each time you level up to rank up. And as you build your ranks, it'll granularly develop your character for you over the career. Mm -hmm. And uh, in doing so, uh, you have basically everybody's got four classes. They start out with a tenderfoot class, which you could think of as being like a squire or a freelancer or a rookie, uh, an apprentice, uh, something along those lines, a student. Uh, and that's your going to be uh, your character growth class. So every choice that you get to make in the Tenderfoot class is entirely custom. You get to pick attributes to increase. You get to pick class abilities to get a bonus to. You get to pick uh, equipment that you can level up regardless of what you or your classes or say that you can level up. Like if you want to use a chain gun, but you're a warrior and you're not, you don't, don't have any ranged type of equipment classes, you can use your knack from your tender foot to level up a chain gun regardless. Mm -hmm. So it allows you to either hyper-specialize your choices or you can lean outside of the scope of your classes to build something special and unique. Yeah. And then you'll select two base classes which you'll level up uh, at your discretion. Um, <clears throat> And uh, once everything is at level three, that's Tenderfoot in each base class, you'll get access to your hybrid class, which is predetermined based off of which two base classes you pick. All right. For instance, if you pick the Marine and the Delinquent uh, at level 10, you will be able to start putting levels into the Sniper hybrid class, which it functions and it improves both of those classes. So... With that, so with that in mind, um, when it comes to now, given the fact that some, that some of you, some of your classes are gonna be are gonna be using some fo some form of magic, mm -hmm. um, from what from what you had from what you had said previously, it sounds like you're not using a Vancian model. So how ex how exactly do you have magic work? Actually, we do use a Vancian model. Uh, we have heroics. So uh, the game has a pool of over 1,300 heroics, 1,300, mm -hmm. 1,300. Um, and uh, basically, every time you place a character level uh, into, you know, you get your class rank and you choose a training rank each level. Ugh. Oh, man, my tongue's fighting itself. You choose a class rank and you choose a training rank each level. Uh, and with each choice, you unlock a couple more heroics, and this you could f think of these as spells. And uh, but the, it really goes beyond the scope of just being spells. It that also includes you know hidden martial techniques, uh, you know secret thief moves, whatever you want to think of it. Your your special sauce, uh, that that secret move you're holding under your sleeve to pull out at an opportune moment. Uh, that is what a heroic is, and you get access to more and more of them as you progress uh, and every level you'll get a couple more that you can pick from and during your downtime you can meditate to swap out your heroics list and come back with a completely new set of spells mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> which means that everybody will kind of have a revolving toolbox of the abilities at their disposal that they can swap out in between adventures at any time mm -hmm. so though given, given that um, I know you. I know you said that you ha that you have a Vancian like setup, but from what I'm seeing, it doesn't fall into the same trap as the typical Vancian model. Mm -hmm. There's not spell slots. Instead, we use uh, an action point pool, um, where you have a second kind of energy bar, stamina bar, whatever you want to call it, um, that represents your your oomph. You know, uh, your ability to do extraordinary uh, heroic things and. Uh, 
if you manage to run out of action points, then you become exhausted, uh, which prevents a character from uh, benefiting from critical rolls. So if you roll a 10 on anything, uh, it's not an automatic success. You just get the face value of the dice. Hmm. Uh, and uh, then once downtime happens, your character has no choice but to rest for eight hours before they can do anything else. But it doesn't sound like you're pre- it doesn't sound like you're preparing heroics in advance. So, um, well, you select your heroics that you have to choose from before you go out, and then you'll have a list of pre-selected abilities at your disposal. And then when you want to change that list, list you have to do it during your downtime for your next adventure. So, I'd say, I'd say it 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 fits it fits only two of the it fits only two of the three um um require requirements I see um, for Vancean. it's not it isn't it isn't full on it isn't a full on Vancean um setup that Lar- that may be true I, I believe you when you say that cuz even th- even though there's the pre- the preparation because of the unless i'm mistaken there is it doesn't sound like there's that that there's um le- that there's leveled variants of e- of each of these much in the same in the same because you do not have the, your equivalent of spell levels when it comes to heroics you just have a list that's correct yeah there's not you can't uh, cast it at a higher level or, and there's none of that it's just you have the ability it does what it does and uh, your access to that ability your ability to even learn that is directly related to your class level or your training level but uh, outside of that there's not like scalability so there's uh, nothing like say overcasting where you yeah no, well okay so adepts can overcast as a class feature uh, and what they do there is they can double the action point cost to double the number of damage dice rolled for any heroic action that inflicts damage mm-hmm. in that in that regard would that also mean that um, that perks would be equivalent to feats they're just they're just um they're just pat they, they would just be on the passive end of things uh, most likely, yeah. Uh, I would say that's the closest parallel. Uh, perks also will do things like uh, cause the way that uh, the sheet like governs. Like, like it'll change attribute assignments. For instance, uh, intimidation. The uh, ability is normally governed by the charm attribute, uh, but there is uh, a perk imposing posture that lets you use your power attribute instead of your charm attribute. Uh, so if you are a character that has high power but low charm and you still want to be intimidating, that's an option. And there are lots of those that allow you to swip, swatch out, uh, swip, blech, switch out different abilities and uh, other things like that to change kind of how your character mechanically works on the back end. And less about, uh, well, well, there are uh, there's a large variety of different kinds of perks. And then there are other ones that apply just to certain cir- circumstances where... You know, if you're trying to disarm somebody, then you get a bonus, and also they don't get a clutch attack for you failing. Mm-hmm. Now, when when it comes to the mobility part on the character sheet, I saw that you have three mobility entries: maneuver, speed, and initiative. Initiative, mm-hmm. I think, is self-explanatory. Um, Correct. Is speed the amount of is speed is speed the amount of movement that you have? And if, yes, if, that is correct. And um, with that in mind, what would maneuver be? Maneuver is going to be any sort of interaction between two characters. Usually, you're going to contest a maneuver with another maneuver, mm-hmm. um, and that is going to be uh, an action that where the goal is to cause a repositioning of sorts, or a tactical change, or a strategic maneuver instead of prioritizing inflicting actual harm to your opponent. So you're trying to disarm them trying to grab them, trying to trip them, trying to steal from them, trying to knock them back. Uh, th- those kinds of actions all would fall under a maneuver. So this would be akin to the manu- the um, maneuver save in Pathfinder. Yeah, it's uh, closest to that, <clears throat> uh, but a little bit more expansive, I-, I would say. Yeah. Now, with... If I'm, if I'm, re- if I'm reading a lot of this right... Would it be fair of me to say that one ma- that one major element of the ca- of the um, character she- of the character creation is that things things cascade along each o- along each other? 
Yes, that is a, a really big part of it. Um, you start with a few base points that really grow and build off of each other to create something that is holy and unique. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, the the other aspect of character creation is bir is birthright, which I'd say would be the equ the equivalent to to race in ter in terms of what you get out of it, but. What, exa what exactly would you get from your choice of birthright? Uh, so when we're talking mechanically, uh, birthright is going to offer a few different attribute changes. You'll get a bonus, a plus two bonus to one attribute, two plus ones, or I'm sorry, a plus one bonus, uh, a minus one, and a, I'm sorry, two minus ones. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I butchered that. One plus two, one plus one, one minus one, one minus one. Uh, and uh, one of the plus one and the minus one are ones that you can choose, mm -hmm. and the plus two and the uh, minus one uh, are also default and not choosable. So it's those those latter two are set by your choice of birthright. Exactly, and then you also get a free class feature based on, or I'm sorry, a class ability based on your uh, birthright choice. So, for instance, if you are from Axis, uh, you get the choice between Deception or Electronics to automatically have a bonus to off off rip just by being from Axis. Yeah, and then that bonus scales with you being a Tenderfoot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, as your Tenderfoot level goes up, so will that bonus. Yeah, and given given the names of the different birth of the different birthrights and the emblems that they have. The vibe that I get out of them is that these are representatives of factions within the setting. Not too far removed from the factions you would see in something like Fallout New Vegas or Stalker. Would that be accurate? Uh, yeah, it's pretty close. Um... So for birthrights, uh, I'll, I'll start out with uh, they're not races. Uh, we made Quantum State with kind of a transhumanist perspective in which uh, what it means to be human is pretty loosely defined. And also we have classes that can just rewrite their genetics on the fly. So having race be like a central theme of it didn't really make sense when anybody can look like whatever they want and the passage of genetics is not something that defines the way that cultures work. Um, so it's hard to build cultures around ancestry or, uh, you know, a shared, uh, and yeah, shared ancestry. Mm -hmm. Um, so instead we uh, took the approach from, uh, ideology. So each of the birthrights represents a set of values or expectations, uh, or ideas or beliefs that were really dominant, uh, of the culture that you grew up in. Uh, and it could be any culture in any town. Uh, you could be from anywhere. Uh, you could look like anything. Uh, but the ideas that you were raised under were what formed you and uh, will shape the lenses that you use to look at the world as you explore further. And whether or not you are for those ideas, you're against those ideas, you're indifferent to those ideas, that is up to the autonomy of the player and how they want their character to be. You could be completely unaffected by growing up in a capitalist hellscape where the corporations ruled everything, or maybe you, you know, drink that sauce and you are trying out here trying to make a profit. Um, you know, what whatever it is that uh, you want your character to be interested in is available here to give you kind of a groundwork for how to act and a foundation of where you fit into society before you've even started playing the game. Yeah. So. With the, within that, within that, um, I would I would like to ask on the since I asked about the classes, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask on the um, birthrights just to get a kind of feel for the direction that they have, how they how they how they approach the world, and and who they may or may not get along with. Um, starting with um, Armstice. All right. Um, yeah, Armistice is a militaristic empire. Uh, their government is called a stratocracy, um, in which uh, everything about their society is built around the upholding of this military structure. 
um, in this strict, you know, military hierarchy where uh, everything that you have in your life is based on what rank you are and how high you can climb the chain of honor. And uh, you know, anybody from the bottom can work their way up to becoming the emperor. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a strict legal structure, and they uh, are place a great, a great emphasis on honor. Um, they're called armistice because they view themselves as the peacekeepers of the world uh, and they sort of wage war uh, for the purpose to end all wars uh, but that will ideally be done under their flag mm -hmm. which you know uh, so uh, that can be a place where you're from uh, and the aesthetics uh, really focused around ancient Rome, uh, really space Roman vibes. Uh, everybody has uh, a standard uniform that when during their military service that they're expected to wear. Uh, however, they can uh, wear unique helmets that kind of serve as their markers uh, as soldiers mm -hmm. um, for, for kind of building mythos and legends around themselves. And... Uh, yeah, uh, a big thing that happens is if they do something dishonorable, they get exiled and cast out of the empire, and they're not allowed to return until they restore their honor. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm get I'm guessing when it comes to this talk of honor with them, that is more of a external honor kind of approach, not internal. Definitely, yeah. Uh, honor is something you go out and claim. Mm -hmm. uh, so next would be access. All right, Axis is going to be your cyberpunk vibes. Um, the aesthetic is heavy into that urbanite, mega metropolis, uh, high tech, low life. You know, everything's chrome and and gold and jewels and uh, you know fancy dresses and uh, business casual mm -hmm. or business formal. Uh, lots of people in suits, suits and ties, and uh, trying to look their best no matter what. Yep. And uh, it's going to be. Uh, driven by hyper capitalism the, there's no sort of government or rule of law in places where axi axions are in charge uh, everything comes down to the pursuit of profit the securing of resources and cutting out competition um, they also uh, are very charming and charismatic and affable and uh, have a upbeat personality and uh, generally or you know uh, they can mm -hmm. uh, but they're also known to be cheats and swindlers and uh, every bad thing that comes from dealing with a business person uh, is something that you can encounter through Axis. Mm -hmm. um, bullet Eater. So the Bullet Eaters are one of the minor uh, birthrights. Uh, the first two, Armistice and Axis, were majors. Those could be found really anywhere. Uh, military might, uh, commerce, those mm -hmm. types of ideas usually are represented through the Axian birthrights. Bullet Eaters, uh, they are scavengers. They represent post-apocalyptic themes. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're going to get a lot of Mad Max uh, fallout kind of uh, end of days scrapping through the desert looking for you know whatever tinkering things you can put together. Um, and Bullet Eaters within the world of Quantum State represent this kind of enigmatic force. Uh, they're roaming war tribes where they have these war machines that rip through the deserts and uh, across the seas. And uh, they can be, you know, deadly marauders. They can be, uh, you know, pragmatic traders. And they can be cunning inventors. Uh, and they are as ruthless as they are smart. Mm-hmm. Um, homestead. So that's going to be your good old boy. Uh, this is uh, your cowboy, wild western, home homesteader, uh, a subsistence family farm uh, out on the out on the range, mm -hmm. trying to you know scrape out a living with what you got. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, you, you work your hardest and uh, spend your night around the bonfire under the stars so that you can wake up and do it all again tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of the settings that you would associate with the Wild West, uh, you know, saloons, small towns, uh, train robberies, that, that kind of thing that you would mm -hmm. see going on. Yep. Um, croning. Croning. 
Fronin is something that holds a really special place in my heart. I really have not seen anything like Cronin in any other game. Um, basically, uh, their journey starts with an infertility plague. Uh, they originally uh, were suffering a, a total loss of uh, children being born in their their you know their nation. Uh, so they had to rely on uh, community building and making sure that every single person was, you know, healthy and uh, performing to the best of their ability, educated uh, and, uh, you know, well taken care of and cared for. Uh, and then uh, with that mindset, um, they eventually discover a machine that uh, is capable of creating living organisms through just monumentally advanced genetic sequencing technology uh, and so they use it to start just printing out genetically perfect humans um, and uh, these humans are raised with these ideals of you know community and uh, you know a, a sort of a, a familial oneness and uh, basically Cronin's are a study in the the demolition of a familial unit. There are no parents. There are no children. Every person that's older than you is an elder in your family. Every person that's younger than you is your child. It's one gigantic collective family. Hmm. And um, as a part of their birthing process, uh, they get these crests that are kind of carved into their skin a bit. Uh, and they're these glowing markings that are unique, kind of like a fingerprint for each crone. And they, uh, so they have these like kind of glowing tattoos that mark their chests, their necks, their faces, uh, their upper mantle, uh, that kind of upper torso area. And uh, they will glow uh, in response to their emotional state. And uh, so whenever they, you know, get happy, it brightens up. If they get angry, it darkens. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, uh, so they've got these things and th these crests. They allow them to uh, commune with one another through a pylon, uh, an ethos pylon. And this pylon will basically allow each crone that's connected to it to have a intimate level of awareness of the emotional state of any other crones that are also connected to the pylon. And uh, through these connections, and the pylons are interconnected all to each other. So if you're connected to one pylon, you're connected to all crones across all pylons. Mm -hmm. and this interchaining connection of pylons is called the nexus and that's kind of the crone's governing body uh they make all of their decisions based off of a uh, global consensus so they're constantly based on their emotional responses making votes for how their society should be run uh subconsciously and it kind of gives them each while they're connected to it uh an emotional prerogative that they must seek out and kind of just this uh, pressing desire to do specific things. Mm -hmm. So, next would be the Malawari. Did I lose you again? Alright, uh, yeah, the Malawari are pretty interesting. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, we kind of have like a really transhumanist sort of focus setting. I think the Malawari really highlight that kind of aspect. They're these transhumanist druids. So uh, their key thing that they are interested in is environmentalism. Uh, that is uh, first and foremost all the way down from being, you know, protectors of the wilds to being straight up eco-terrorist. Um, they will uh, do whatever it takes to secure the safety of the natural world. Um, and they live in secluded circles. They have uh, access to, uh, they're, they're dissimulationist. So they will actively seek out uh, things that they perceive to be as dangerous um, uh, for the express point of containing it or destroying it or locking it away in, uh, in a way that nobody else can access it because they view it as a threat to existence. Uh, but in doing so, they also have access to some of the most advanced technology, and they they will hoard it, uh, what for what they think is the greater good. And they have yeah, so the most advanced technology, the most advanced magic, and they live uh, in isolated seclusion amongst their circles out in 
you know the the wilderness, mm -hmm. uh, and they have a limited range of interaction with uh, other civilizations. But still, uh, members can be seen and interacted with, encountered throughout the land, or small isolated circles can be run into as a part of any adventure. Mm -hmm. So, um, Merkan. The Mercon, uh, those are going to be your pirates of the sky and sea. Uh, they, uh, you could, <laughs> basically, I was like, let's take Balthier from Final Fantasy XII and make him into an entire, like, <laughs> you know, uh, an entire uh, group of people. So, yeah, uh, so sky pirates, um, they are all about trading and piracy, and uh, their whole thing is uh, they have uh, a pantheon of legendary ship captains called the the princes the mercana mm. and uh they aspire to either join their ranks or become the crew for one of them uh and uh, what they need to become a prince is they have to secure a battleship worthy of joining the iron armada which is the strongest naval force in in universe mm -hmm. um they need a horde of treasure that is a sign of their uh, value as either a merchant or a pirate and they need a loyal crew to man the ship uh, that they have secured if they can't run the ship then why even have it and, I'm uh, and, and once they uh, show up with those uh, they have to do something to the standing princes the ones that are currently princes they will have to uh, set a task for them to uh, you know christen their entry just make sure not to do it with a bottle of champagne as I was saying just make sure not to do it with a bottle of champagne because that's bad luck <laughs> absolutely uh, remnant Ooh, the remnants are a cool one I would say that remnants are one of the most popular choices they're another minor birthright uh, so the remnants are actually from the, uh, dare I call it a prequel, the precursory events uh, leading up to the creation of the world. Um, the remnants are part of the original humanity that was at its peak before its downfall into where we are now for quantum state. Um, and the way that that story begins is that uh, humanity reached the peak of its creation uh, by constructing a superstructure, a celestial superstructure. Uh, you could think of it like the Death Star, but the purpose of this uh, ship called the Fonterra was to breathe life into dead planets. That was the entire purpose. It was a generational uh, starship with terraforming capabilities. Um, on their maiden voyage, they fly up to their first uh, planet to terraform it. Uh, in the middle of the process, uh, Earth goes dark. Uh, they're not sure it gets destroyed or if something took it, uh, but it's just vanished out of the picture. And uh, that creating the Fonterra to be the last bastion of humanity and human civilization in space. Um, <clears throat> which, uh, over the years, uh, as they reach the completion of the terraforming process, uh, how humanity should move forward becomes kind of an issue uh, and these differences become really deep and stark amongst the society living on the Fonterra and we're talking about billions and billions of people living on the ship mm -hmm. and um, eventually it breaks out into a very pyrrhic civil war uh, that causes catastrophic failures amongst the ship due to uh, you know, uh, in fighting and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It starts with a C. Collateral damage. <laughs> yeah, lots of collateral damage from this war. Uh, mm -hmm. And they had uh, on the ship, they had this thing called the Remnant Protocol where if a person died, they could take your body and uh, basically download a copy of you into an ageless synthetic human body, allowing you to live a second life again. Um, but uh, in order to escape the eventual cataclysmic destruction of the Fonterra, many people decided to enroll into the Remnant Protocol uh, 
forcibly ending their lives early to download a copy of their consciousness into these synthetic robot humans. Uh, you know, this is ageless synthetic human bodies uh, that were then locked away into a deep stasis uh, to survive the ultimate destruction of the Fonterra, which uh, uh, eventually it does become destroyed and it is scattered into a ring around the planet. So there's just a ring of super advanced technology floating around the low orbit of SALT, which is the planet where this takes place. Mm -hmm. And periodically, uh, fragments of the Fonterra called Fallen Shards will plummet down to the planet's surface and just embed itself uh, where there's just this gigantic ruin now of ancient machinery uh, that's far more advanced than anything that humanity has risen to since then. Um, and uh, it, within these ruins, uh, the remnants can awaken and uh, eventually, you know, try to rebuild their life uh, with everything that they've known uh, destroyed, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other part of remnants that I think makes them super interesting is that they have an uh, endemic uh, mental disease. Uh, it's a, a cognitive defect. Uh, so they have ageless immortal bodies. They don't age, uh, and they are very, very hardy. Uh, so they generally uh, will out-survive anything that doesn't like really kill them. Uh, they're not going to age out. Uh, they're not going to age to death. But over time, their mind will deteriorate, and uh, their past will begin to bleed in with their present, and uh, they'll start to relive their most intense moments over and over again. Uh, and as it progresses, eventually they become eff effectively stricken with madness as they can no longer tell what's uh, a reflection of their past and what's their current reality. And this makes them go uh, pretty much insane where they'll uh, isolate themselves, go walk off into the wilderness to go and suffer alone. Um, and, and that's uh, a thing and you can encounter uh, remnants that are too far gone and have become corrupted. Um, but they're also like ancient warlords or whatever, uh, ha having, you know, uh, survived a, a civil war that was thousands of years old that had the biggest, like most catastrophic result for humanity ever. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a roundabout way, I, I end up being reminded of two things the way you describe Remnant. One of them is Yorha from Nier Automata. The mm -hmm. other is... Um, the mo probably the most disliked um, faction within Fallout 4, the Institute. Yeah, yeah, I definitely see a lot of parallels between those two. Uh, the, the If you were to play uh, a, a module where you're running like a, a, what, um, a near automata game in Quantum State, Remnants would be a great choice for 2B. That, that's a, a very accurate uh, sort of uh, depiction of it. Like, yeah. They're in, indistinguishable, really, from human, but clearly not human. Um, and they, they don't age, but they can die. And, I and they, they will go crazy over time. I should not I should note that the going crazy over time isn't far removed from the relapses that can happen with get, with Gestalts within Nier's universe. Mm -hmm. Which also was an attempt to try and prolong, prolong humanity after a extinction-level event, so there's that. Yeah, I think the near universe would be be a great candidate for running a campaign in Quantum State. Mm -hmm. oh, and lastly, Requiem. Uh, Requiem is the final of the big four, uh, along with Axis, Armistice, and Cronin. Um, Requiem is the oldest, uh, and they represent theocracy, spirituality, or leadership through religion. Um, and uh, Requiem represents the dominant religion of the universe, um, or well, of the quantum state universe. Um, <clears throat> it's a, a godless universe, so there's no deities or any beings that function as an extension of a deity, so no gods, no angels, no demons, no devils, nothing like that. Uh, anything that is extra dimensional will fall more into the category of like an eldritch abomination, uh, like horror type of uh, like realm of things mm -hmm. um so in requiem uh they preach the path which is the uh a religion that's based in self-discovery uh and the general consensus is that we are all 
collectively on a journey and also simultaneously on all of our own individual journeys and how you move through life is of utmost importance and you should use your reflections of spirituality to govern those choices. Um, the way you describe it, it sounds very Taoist. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it kind of uh, does uh, the the there is no free will, um, but however, you will still make choices. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of your choices are already accounted for. Um, however, you will still have to make them anyway as you travel along the path, and you should seek that guidance and don't feel doubt. Uh, because doubt means that you are going against your gut feelings, and, and uh, that's really what it's about. It's about being true to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and then their uh, governing body is uh, a chair called the Pontiff, and uh, they have a, a prelate council of a bunch of uh, the most influential members of different sects that have arisen based off of their interpretation of the path. Um, and an example of some of these sects would be like the divine eyes, which they travel the path of knowledge. Um, and, uh, they are all about like prophecy and, uh, astronomy and, uh, they are all about magic and are big into uncovering, you know, arcane secrets and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, in contrast, you have a, another path like the, uh, the four now as the the craftsman's path and they're all about constructing monuments and building the best things that you can build and uh you know like a, a sort of philosophy for artisans to follow um and, and there's just different ones that based on the things that you find important in life that you would adhere to mm -hmm. so with with all of that in mind um when um, what would what would you be shooting for as far as a total page count? I I know these kind of things can be in flux. Ooh, can you hear me? Oh, I can now. Okay. Oh, all right. So uh, the we we've already done all of the text. Uh, all the text has been written. Uh, it's currently in editing. So the page count uh, after. Or I'm sorry, uh, for text only before art is hovering around 950 pages um, for two books split between uh, the character's handbook and the adventure guide which the character's handbook is going to be everything that a player needs to build an avatar to play the game and the adventure guide uh, is kind of a stand in for the DMG but it also includes a monster manual and a whole bunch of items and uh, stuff but it's for the the docent, which is our, our GM, uh, to run the game, everything that they would need to build worlds. It's a, a whole a holistic philosophy on creating your own games. Uh, it, not necessarily like a, a standalone setting to use with other games. This is a its own setting that you, or I'm sorry, this own system that you can create and put your own settings to this system to play. And I, I can I can certainly get I can certainly get that. And given that one of the given that one one of the birthrights is, amounts to sky pirates, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have do you have plans on putting vehicular re or even ship combat? Uh, there are some rules for for ship combat in uh, in the adventure guide, I believe. Um, and there's also vehicle rules uh, for. I like to take a modular approach to everything. So you use a frame, and then you outfit that frame based on what kind of things that you want the vehicle to be able to do. Um, and then uh, whenever you get into like ship versus ship combat, we have uh, segments where uh, everybody has a job, and based on what job you've got, you've got a few different actions that you can take. And uh, if your actions are successful, you help the ship out in some way. If you're like an engineer, you can pull shields up, or if you're piloting, you can pull a stunt, or you know. You're the captain. You can uh, give your role to somebody else <laughs> to uh, make sure that they do a good job, um, and then uh, they weigh how each sh ship does as a collective unit against each other, and uh, that can cause people to be taken out. Uh, you get go you go offline. Maybe your boarding party gets captured. Um, there, there's tons of different options, and uh, as you run out of crew. Uh, if your ship is below half crew and the other ship lands a hit on you, your ship goes down. 
Mm-hmm. And I think because because um since you mentioned train robberies, that's the other reason I bring I bring a vehicular combat because mm-hmm. the mo- the most fam- the most famous early the most famous early film was the Great Train Robbery. This is true. So b- between that and the fact that you were leaning heavily into a a space western essentially, um, mm-hmm. to the point that somebody's going to be re- somebody's going to probably channel Firefly if they have if you haven't already. Um, oh, absolutely. That's a, a, some sort of train, jo- some sort of train job, or some sort of hijacking a a ship is going to happen. Yeah, we we definitely have a whole lot of rules for using ships uh, as like an actual, not necessarily like a creature, but uh, using it as kind of a moving set piece, uh, a, a mobile base of operations, uh, kind of like having your hub that goes with you. Hmm. And uh, also, uh, since you mentioned the train robbery, we do have uh, in our our quick start rule book, um, we have a, an introductory mission that has uh, the players navigating through a train as they try to uh, extract uh, their target uh, while navigate while yeah dealing with a whole bunch of challenges along the way. Um, and, and the way that we orchestrated that was you start in the back of the train and you work your way up to the front car by car where you're told that you need to get to the front of the train to stop it. And after you stop the train, you have to exit the train through the rear while dealing with the consequences of all the motions you set in place as you were traveling to the front of the car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that can, I'm, guess, I'm guessing that even, even though it's in this case it would be moving to the front of the car, that could be um, that could be messed around with to, to have to account for other types of vehicles. Yeah, and uh, during that, uh, well, not to, you know, reveal too much uh, as far as spoilers, but after you uh, bring the car to a stop, uh, you do have interactions where the train is swarmed by other vehicles, and you can either, even take shots at them with a railgun to, like, blow them out of the sand, uh, have some of them be eaten by a dune worm, uh, all, all sorts of crazy stuff as far as like vehicle on vehicle interactions mm-hmm. and I, and that's something I'll be looking forward to to and with that with that in mi- with that in mind um, what would you say what would you say were some of the big takeaways the big learning experience in develop in trying to develop a full-on game of this magnitude uh, the key takeaway, I think, is that it's super important to focus on community building. Um, I would also say don't underestimate the importance of paid advertising. Pretty, yeah, I can, I can, cer- I can certainly see that. Uh, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my to my tumble to enjoy the madness that happens around here yeah it was wonderful to get to talk to you and uh you know explain my game and and you were you were great this was a fun, fantastic experience mm-hmm. and anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Mildred. I had a great time. Thanks for having me on. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.